from Love Amalia by Alma Flor Ada and Gabriel M. Zubizareta. What is it, Amalia? Is something bothering you? Amalia's grandmother removed the boiling honey from the stovetop to let it cool. Then she wiped her forehead with a tissue and looked at her granddaughter. The light from the setting sun entered the small window over the sink with a soft glow. The geraniums on the windowsill added a subtle hint of pink. You are too quiet, Ijita. Tell me what's bothering you, her grandmother insisted. It is obvious that something is wrong. It's okay, abuelita, de verdad. I'm fine. Amalia tried to sound convincing, but her grandmother continued. Is it because Martha did not come with you today? Is she all right? Going to her grandmother's home on Friday afternoon was something Amalia had been doing since she was little. For the last two years, since they started fourth grade, her friend Martha accompanied her most Fridays. Every week Amalia looked forward to the time she spent at her grandmother's house, but today was different. Amalia paused before answering. She is not coming back anymore, abuelita. Nunca mas! Despite Amalia's efforts to control her feelings, her voice cracked and her brown eyes watered. ¿Qué pasa, hijita? What's going on? Amalia's grandmother asked softly, gently hugging her and waiting for an explanation. Amalia shook her head, as she frequently did when she was upset, and her long black hair swept her shoulders. Martha is going away. Her family is moving west, to some weird place in California, so far away from Chicago. Today she had to go straight home to start packing. It's not fair. That must be difficult, her grandmother's voice was filled with understanding, and Amalia let out a great sigh. For a while there was silence. The sunlight faded in the kitchen, and as the boiled honey cooled into a dark, thick mass, its sweet aroma filled the air. Shall we need the melcocha, then? Amalia's grandmother asked as she lifted the old brass pot onto the kitchen table and poured the sticky melcocha into a bowl. The thick white porcelain bowl, with a few chips that spoke of its long use, had a wide yellow rim. Once, the bowl had made Amalia think that it looked like a small sun on the kitchen table. Today, she was too upset to see anything but the heavy bowl. They washed their hands thoroughly in the sink and dried them. Her grandmother's kitchen towels each had a day of the week embroidered in a different color. Since today was Friday, the cross-stitched embroidery spelled Viernes in azul marino, deep blue. Abuelita had taught Amalia the days of the week and the names of the colors in Spanish using these towels. Although her grandmother never seemed to be teaching, Amalia was frequently surprised when she realized how many things she had learned from Abuelita. After drying their hands, they slathered them with soft butter, which prevented the taffy from sticking to their fingers or burning their skin. Then, with a large wooden spoon, Abuelita scooped some taffy from the bowl and poured it onto their hands. As they pulled and kneaded, the taffy became softer and lighter. They placed little rolls of amber-colored taffy on pieces of waxed paper. Amalia had helped her grandmother pull the melcocha many times, but she never ceased to marvel at how the sweet taffy changed color just from being pulled, kneaded, and pulled again. It transformed from a deep, dark brown into a light blonde color, just like Martha's hair. Thinking about Martha made Amalia frown. Her grandmother might have seen her expression, but made no comment about it. Rather, she said, wash your hands well, Amalita. Let's sit for a moment while the taffy cools down. Before washing her hands, Amalia licked her fingers. Nothing tasted as good as cleaning up after cooking. The butter and taffy mixed together made a sweet caramel on her fingers, which was every bit as good as the raw cookie dough they cleaned up when she and Martha made cookies at Martha's house. Once Amalia had washed and dried her hands, she followed her grandmother to the living room. They both sat on the floral sofa, which brightened the room as if a piece of the garden had been brought inside the house. Abuelita's fondness for the colors of nature could be seen in each room of her house. I know how hard it is when someone you love goes away. One moment you are angry, 
Then you become sad, and then it seems so unbelievable you almost erase it. Then, when you realize it is true, the anger and the sadness come back all over again, sometimes even more painfully than before. I have gone through that many times. Amalia listened closely, trying to guess who her grandmother was talking about. Was she thinking of her two sons who lived far away, or her daughter who always promised to visit from Mexico City but never did? Or was she referring to her husband, Amalia's grandfather, who had died when Amalia was so young that she could not remember him? But one finds ways, Amalia, to keep them close, her grandmother added. And then, smiling as if having just gotten a new idea, she said, Ven, come with me. She then got up and motioned Amalia to follow her to the dining room. Amalia just wanted to end the conversation. It was bad enough that Martha had told her that she had a surprise and had it turned out to be that Martha was moving to California very soon. Martha's leaving sounded so definite and permanent that she hated even the thought of it. Talking about it only made Amalia feel worse. She wished she did not need to wait for her father to pick her up and could just walk home. Maybe then she could call Martha and hear her say that it had all been a great mistake and they were not moving after all. And it would all disappear like bad dreams do in the morning. Abuelita signaled Amalia to come sit at the massive dining room table. Before she sat down, Abuelita put on a CD quietly in the background. Amalia could not remember Abuelita's home ever without some soft music. On the lace tablecloth, there was a stack of Christmas cards, several red and gold leaves, and a box made of beautiful olive wood that Amalia immediately recognized. Her grandmother used that box to save the special cards and letters sent by relatives and close friends. At the bottom, there were old letters neatly kept in bundles tied with ribbons. Amalia loved the feel of the old polished wood, the gentle waves that had been stroked so many times before. Are you writing your Christmas cards already, Abuelita? It's not even Thanksgiving. Amalia was relieved to change the subject. What are the dry leaves for? I like writing my cards slowly, her grandmother replied as she picked up an unfinished card. That way I can really think about what I will write on each one. There are so many things I want to say. After a moment, almost as if talking to herself, Abuelita added, I've made terrible mistakes in my life when I didn't think before speaking. Amalia looked up, surprised. Abuelita always looked so calm and sure. It was almost impossible to imagine her acting foolishly. Looking at the half-written card, Abuelita continued, As I was telling you, one must find ways to keep loved ones close even if they move away. This year I have decided to send a little bit of my backyard with each card. Every year at this time, my children and I had many good moments getting ready for the holidays. So I have gathered some of this autumn's leaves to remind them of those times. Look at this one and she held a maple leaf that had turned a deep crimson. See how red it is? One of the things I have always loved about this house is seeing the trees change colors with the seasons. The same is true with the things we treasure. They happen, bloom for a time, and then fade away. Then sometimes they may reappear again, or something else will take their place. Holding the leaves up one by one, she added, there is a poem I like very much. The poet says that a dry leaf is not an elegy, a song of death, but rather a prelude, a promise of a distant spring. Abuelita almost seemed lost in her own thoughts, but then she returned to Amalia, saying, Before writing each card, I like to read ones I received from the person to whom I am about to write. This reminds me that I am not the only one who wants to stay close. Do you want to look at some of last year's cards with me? Sure, Abuelita, Amalia said, pushing back the lock of hair that kept falling in her face. She always enjoyed listening to her grandmother's stories, especially stories about their family. The distant relatives, some of whom Amalia could not remember ever meeting, came alive when Abuelita spoke about them. Even things that happened a long time ago, like the story of how her grandfather's parents had come from Mexico to Chicago, 
became so real when Abuelita told them that Amalia felt as if she had actually been there. Today she did not feel much like listening, but making an effort to show some enthusiasm for her grandmother's offer, she added, You can tell me all about the people who sent them. Abuelita began pulling cards out of the box one by one. With each card she had something to say, and although she had spoken about these faraway relatives many times before, it seemed to Amalia that today she was adding special details to every story. Holding a card with a picture of a lush landscape, Abuelita spoke for a while about her oldest son. Amalia's tío Patricio had fallen in love with a Costa Rican girl he met at the University of Chicago. Soon after they graduated, they got married, and because she did not want to live far away from her family, they moved to Costa Rica. He was very concerned about leaving me and moving away. However, I reminded him that we, too, had moved away, and sometimes that is necessary, Abuelita said. It's true that I gained a beautiful daughter-in-law and grandchildren, but it has been hard having my eldest child live so far from me. Yet they love each other and have a happy family, and that, Amalita, is one of life's greatest gifts. See how happy they look in this picture they took as soon as they arrived in Costa Rica. It wasn't easy to imagine Tio Patricio and Tia Graciela as two young people in love when Amalia thought of the pictures her mother had received from them recently. In those pictures, Tio Patricio was a balding man and Tia Graciela a rather proper-looking lady. But in the old photo Abuelita held, they were a handsome young couple looking adoringly at each other under a palm tree, almost like a movie poster. Abuelita gently put away the card with a pleased look on her face. Someday you must go to Costa Rica, Amalia, and visit them. It is an amazing place. The next card was in the shape of a large Christmas tree and said Feliz Navidad in bold letters. Abuelita opened it and read it in silence very slowly as if pausing on every word. Your tío Manuel is quite a person, Amalia. When my brother, your great-uncle Felipe, said it was becoming hard for him to manage the old rancho alone, Manuel went back to Mexico to help his uncle. Who do you know that goes back to Mexico to work on a farm? Everyone says they would like to go back someday, while the truth is, most people just come here and stay. But no, not your uncle Manuel. He kept saying how important that land was for his family, and that he was not going to give it up. So even though he was born and raised here in Illinois, he went back and learned how to work the rancho. And he has done such a good job of it. Abuelita looked very pleased. There was a time when I was not sure your uncle would turn out as he has. He did many dumb things when he was in high school and ended up dropping out. Your grandfather was very hard on him, and it broke my heart at the time. She paused, and for an instant Amalia could see the pain those memories brought but then Abuelita smiled. Yet he has managed to save our rancho. When he first talked about organic farming, people laughed at his idea, but now he is doing just great. There are no tomatoes that can compare with the ones he produces. Amalia continued listening with interest. It was comforting to hear Abuelita retelling the familiar stories. Especially today, after Martha's announcement had shattered her, it was good to hear once again the words she had anticipated Abuelita would say, as she had on other occasions. Ay, hijita, how we loved that rancho. It was there where my brother Felipe and I were born, on the kitchen table. There was no doctor, of course. We were born with the help of our aunts. Who would ever have thought I would end up living so far away? When I married your grandfather, he knew how homesick I was for the ranch. We went back there as a couple once before we had children, and then when our children were very little, we went several times during the summer. When they grew older, it got harder to travel, but we all loved those visits. It seemed to Amalia that as her grandmother spoke of those distant memories, her eyes sparkled like the lake when the sun's rays hit it at midday. Amalia wished Abuelita could just pick her up and hold her tightly as she used to do when Amalia was smaller, reassuring her grandchild that she belonged to something that would never change. But Amalia was bigger now, and Abuelita seemed to keep getting smaller, so Amalia just let herself feel surrounded by the warmth of her grandmother's voice. 
Holding a Christmas card with a huge poinsettia, her grandmother began to speak of Amalia's aunt, who lived in Mexico City and made costumes for movie and television actresses. Here is another one who went back. My daughter is just so in love with Mexico City. She's been fascinated by dresses ever since she was a little girl. She would draw them and color them and cut them out for her paper dolls. Each doll had quite a wardrobe. They had clothes for work and play, for traveling and for theater, for going to dances and even for picnics. There was no end to their clothes. Abuelita gestured with her hands as if to encompass the huge table, and Amalia could just see it covered with colorful paper doll clothes. And that is why she lives in Mexico City, in the capital, in El de Efe. She says she could never have the same opportunity in Hollywood, but in Mexico she dresses all the most famous stars. She paused for a moment, and when she spoke again, her voice had a joyful ring to it. You can't imagine, mi amor, how your mother and her sister would play together when they were little girls. Well, you do know that's why your mother called you Amalia, so that you'd have her sister's name. They were inseparable, those two. Whether they were jumping rope or playing jacks, they spent all their time together. What they liked best, though, besides those paper dolls, were the times they spent playing in the yard. They would climb trees, play tag, build pretend castles, and imagine being princesses. In the summer, your abuelito would set up a small plastic pool, and they loved swimming in that pool. It was very small, but they didn't care because they had each other. Abuelita probably would have continued telling more stories, but she was interrupted by a light knock on the door. It was already dark, and Amalia's father had come to get her. As Amalia was leaving, her grandmother hugged her and whispered in her ear, you will find a way to stay close to Martha. Riding in the car, Amalia pondered her grandmother's words. They had brought back the sorrow she had been able to forget while listening to the family stories. Who cares about staying close, she thought. I don't want to care about someone who won't be here.